Welcome to our Pork, Poultry, and Penicillin webinar. The webinar will start in just a few moments. All right, Tiffany, go ahead when you're ready. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our free webinar this afternoon, uh, Pork, Poultry, and Penicillin, Health Impacts of the Industrial Food Animal Production. Can change slides. Um, <clears throat> And we also just wanted to let you know that this upcoming weekend there will be a um, similar forum that we encourage you all to, to attend called the Rural Health Dim Dilemma, a forum about the impact of modern agriculture on health and quality of life. And that is um, in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, and it's a, a full-day conference. And this serves as a fabulous pre-conference session to that conference. So we hope that you'll be able to attend that change slides. Um, <clears throat> I uh, represent Sustain Rural Wisconsin Network, one of the partnering organizations that is hosting this webinar today. Um, SRWN is a statewide coalition of individuals and organizations who are dedicated to preserving the environment while maintaining the health and economic vitality of rural communities. Uh, my name is Tiffany Lutholds, and I am the Water Quality and Quantity Coordinator for SRWN. And I just wanted to encourage folks to um, find us online um, on our Facebook page and also our website. Uh, we have a, a lot of wonderful resources available to folks that are addressing CAFO and other um, issues you know, around water quality and um, so on and so forth in their communities. We have a whole toolkit of information, um, including water monitoring, um, mentors that you can get help learning how to do that in your own communities, and just a variety of great resources. So we, we hope that you'll join us um, as we, on our web presence. Change slides. <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about um, SRWN's vision for rural Wisconsin and how it pertains to this webinar. Um, we're devoted to promoting sustainable agriculture and policies that support environmentally sound, socially responsible, and profitable agriculture. And what's really important is that we envision um, so farms that are sized appropriately and that make full use of the nutrients that are generated themselves by the livestock. Um, we want it to be that such that the conditions for the livestock are are such that the antibiotics are not required in feed but are just reserved for treatment of serious infections. Um, these farms will be fairly compensated and are family owned and operated for generations. And we and that's really what this webinar is about. <clears throat> Change slides. So um, I, without further ado, I'm going to um, turn it over to our speaker, um, Dr. David Wallinga, and he's the Director of Healthy Food Action. And he um, has also been on the um, steering committee for um, Keep Antibiotics Working, the campaign to end antibiotic overuse. Um, and in addition to Dr. Wallingo, at the end of the call, we'll have a question and answer session. And Tara Heinzen, the staff attorney at the Environmental Integrity Project, will be available to answer questions that might pertain to water quality issues or the Clean um, Water Act and so on and so forth. So, um, we hope that um, you'll have some great questions at the end of Dr. Wallinger's presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to uh, Dr. Wallinger. Hey, thanks, Tiffany. And uh, thanks for you all for uh, you know, taking your precious time at night to uh, join us here. 
Um, Tiffany asked me to do a training. So this is kind of a webinar slash training for you all. And um, really it's an introduction to how I, as a physician, kind of look at some of the issues that I'm sure you've talked about and think about, but we might think and talk about them in slightly different ways. And um, Tiffany mentioned that I direct something called Healthy Food Action. And, uh, you know, the, the rationale behind Healthy Food Action is that uh, a lot of the issues that we're all worried about have impacts at the farm level, but they also have impacts at the population health level. And yet, um, uh, you know, the five or seven million individual health professionals in the country often don't weigh in. So we're working to create a network of health professionals who not only think about nutrition, but also about uh, what we can do to incentivize healthy food raised on healthier, more sustainable farms. So it's very complementary to the work of the SRWN. So before I get started, I just want to um, say I'm, I'm going to talk for a while, maybe 25, 30 minutes. So if you find yourself getting bored, uh, and I hope you don't, but um, just think of some questions and put them in the chat function. And Rachel, who introduced the call, will keep track of them. And then when we have a Q&A, and I think we're going to have 20 or 30 minutes of Q&A at the end, um, then we'll be able to sift through those and answer some of your questions. Okay? Um, here's just a rough little outline for what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about why health matters, at least in my opinion why places matter, and then use those frames to talk about um, industrial food animal production and, and impacts on health. And we'll focus on uh, water quality and kind of the issue of antibiotic overuse as a case study. So it's not meant to be exhaustive. Uh, if you want the exhaustive treatment, please go to the Sturgeon Bay uh, uh, event on Saturday, and I think you'll get a, a much more in-depth look. So first of all, why does health matter? Well, um, uh, if you scan the medical literature the way I do, uh, what you hear about repeatedly are epidemics. Uh, we as a population are not getting healthier. We're getting less healthy. And uh, that has enormous implications. And we've got epidemics of chronic disease. And you might have, you might have some experience, personal or family, with some of these, like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, but I'm talking about thinking of them as a whole. And so uh, almost half of Americans have at least one of these chronic conditions. They're virtually all life-threatening, or can be, and they're all very expensive and very impactful on ourselves and our families. But over a quarter of us actually have multiple uh, conditions, multiple chronic diseases. And it's not just chronic diseases, it's um, some acute infections that are epidemic too. So we used to think, we, we got a little complacent because we had 30 or 40 years of a pretty good pipeline of antibiotics that were, uh, gave us a lot of comfort, a lot of buffer against infections. And so if one didn't work, we could try another one and so on and so on. But we kind of shoot, shot our wad of antibiotics. And so now we're increasingly at a point where common infections either are really, really hard to treat or even impossible to treat. And, you know, uh, as we as we hear more about impossible to treat infections, we're talking about people that get very, very sick or die. And so the Centers for Disease Control just a couple of months ago came out with a really landmark report on this problem. And its estimate is that we've got over 2 million infections a year caused by antibiotic resistant organisms. And a lot of these end up in hospitals. To treat one of these as compared to an infection that used to be what we call antibiotic susceptible or treatable. It costs about $40,000 more per case to treat a resistant infection than an easy to treat infection. And then of course we've got all these deaths too. So these are a lot of different bugs 
everything from gonorrhea to MRSA to Salmonella, Campylobacter, and E. coli. So they're both gram-positive and gram-negative bugs, and it's, it's a lot of them. Um, and just to give you a little primer on how does antibiotic resistance happen, and you, you know, the brief thing is that if you remember back to high school biology, it's kind of like Darwin talked about. We got a lot of germs, they're not going away. In fact, we need them in many respects. And a few are gonna naturally be drug resistant. And so more and more of us are taking too many antibiotics. And uh, what those do is they might kill off bacteria that cause illness, but they also select for those naturally resistant bacteria. And so um, when you are exposed to an antibiotic, it makes it easier for those resistant bacteria to take over whatever we're talking about, whether it's a countertop or a hospital setting or your gut. And those resistant bacteria um, can often go on to cause problems. So as, as we look at this problem in aggregate, I mentioned that it was pretty expensive. We're talking about maybe $26 billion a year in extra healthcare costs alone. If you factor in the lost work time from the lost work time from uh, having those infections, it could be tens of billions of dollars more. And um, let's tally up the the cost of all these chronic diseases plus the resistant infections, and you see that why health matters is to policymakers at least, if not to us as taxpayers is that the total bill is like $500 billion a year, all right? And what I'm here to talk to you about is how uh, all of these, or many of these, additional costs are tied back to the food system that we've created, and specifically the industrial food system. So I'm, I might not hit all the dimensions of that today, but I'm gonna give you some. So the same CDC report says up to half of the antibiotic use in people and much of the antibiotic use in animals is unnecessary and inappropriate and makes everyone less safe. So um, why is that key? Because when we overuse antibiotics, we speed along the process of resistance. So the more we use them, the faster we lose them, basically. So just to give you an idea, um, 29 million pounds of antibiotics sold every year are used on food animals. And we know these numbers are accurate because by law the pharmaceutical companies are required to report these figures to the FDA. And we can compare that with 7 million pounds a year used on humans. So this isn't a perfect measure, but just by this crude measure of volume, 80% of the antibiotics sold in the country are used in food animal production. Now, some of those are used to treat sick animals, so they might be injected into a sick cow or a sick pig, and everybody thinks that's a good idea. But the vast majority of those 29 million are, in fact, not injected. They're put in animal feed or water for a slew of different purposes that I'm going to talk more about. But um, most of them... Uh, the vast majority, again, aren't by prescription. So, you know, I'm in the Midwest like you guys are. So I can go to Fleet Farm or Menards or, you know, Sam's Club sometimes. And even on the Internet, without a prescription, and buy these antimicrobials. And um, that's not a problem if that doesn't, if, if that doesn't lead to overuse. But if people abuse the ready access of these, it can be quite a big problem. And just to show you that the, these antibiotics put in animal feed are not different, by and large, from those used in humans. They're often the same. So you'll see from this data, again, from the FDA, there are some things that are only used in animals, uh, like the ionophores. But then there are classes like tetracyclines or penicillins that are used in both people and animals. Macrolids are things like erythromycin. I'm going to talk later about sulfa drugs, and there the use is about split even between animals and humans. And these are kilograms, by the way. So for tetracyclines, we're talking about 
over 11 million pounds a year are used in food animal production. So it, uh, obviously the U.S. isn't the only country that raises animals for food. Um, if you look at countries in the European Union, a lot of them have uh, 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 large animal production industries too. Just to name two, the Netherlands and Denmark. Um, but there's huge variation from country to country in how they use antibiotics. And so one way to look at that is to compare the use on a milligram per kilogram of meat produced level. So you see this huge variation, and, and this is a few years old now, between the Netherlands, for example, where they use about 180 milligrams of antibiotics per kilogram of meat or biomass produced, and then Denmark's closer to 50. So roughly three and a half times more in the Netherlands than Denmark. And, and not coincidentally, the Netherlands has now kicked off a campaign to really reduce their antibiotic use in agriculture. Now, where does the U.S. stack up? Um, the veterinarians who are in charge of uh, monitoring antimicrobial resistance and surveillance in Denmark estimate that the U.S. is here roughly 50% higher again than the Netherlands, or six times higher than Denmark, around 300 milligrams per kilogram of meat produced in the U.S. So um, just to give you a little bit of a flavor um, uh, of where public health is at right now in terms of these epidemics that I started talking about, um, People used to have kind of a simplistic way of looking at disease and looked at it from an individual by individual approach, but the obesity epidemic and the epidemics of infectious disease have really rendered that kind of medical model out of date. And now more and more what you're hearing uh, health foundations and the CDC and others talk about is an environmental approach to health. And so, um, the California Endowments One Foundation that has kicked off a whole campaign around place and how place helps determine health, and they call it Health Happens Here. And you'll see why I want to talk about this a little bit more. So for example, uh, in California and other places like Minneapolis, they've done maps comparing two neighborhoods that are virtually side by side. And the life expectancy between those neighborhoods can vary by 14 years, even longer. Uh, so if you were born, you happen to be born in one neighborhood, uh, you can expect to live, you know, roughly 20% longer than being born down the road. And again, it goes back to this idea that place, as much as anything in the clinic, actually helps determine how long we live and how well we live. And so I just wanted to make the point that here in the upper Midwest, and particularly in the rural areas where a lot of you live, health happens there too. And what we do in our communities, our rural communities, impacts on health. And so you see that uh, we're in the middle of the Corn Belt, and uh, you know that means that we're living near or on major waterways. It also means that we are living in an environment determined by uh, corn production practices that have impacted the landscape where we live quite profoundly. And then um, we also live in a part of the country where there's a lot of food animal production, whether it's dairy in Wisconsin or hogs in Minnesota and Iowa. And in both cases, the point I want to make here is that the concentration of these agricultural systems in a relatively confined area geographically seems to be a critical thing to concentration health impacts. And that concentration is part of and you know, I realize I might be uh, kind of preaching to the choir here, but part of uh, what others and I call industrial model of food animal production. And there's a lot of reasons, I think, why 
if you look back, we can see why this model came about. Um, certainly, uh, the history of the Midwest as being relatively unpopulated relative to the eastern seaboard, for example. The fact that historically a lot of uh, research dollars through the land grants were put into uh, first uh, feed and uh, feed grain and oil seed production, corn and soybeans, and later into animal models that would make use of those as feed. And then third and fourth, uh, policy more and more has been driving the industrialization of food animals uh, as well as globalization trends. So some of the characteristics of what I call that model are that farms rather than being little models of ecological, uh, uh, kind of ecologically contained models of production, farms have been reduced to sort of an analysis that looks at them as food factories with inputs and outputs. And relative to how agricultural uh, production used to be done, uh, what's novel, too, is that we disconnected the animal production from the uh, manure and from the grain production. So this may not be true for some of our smaller Wisconsin farms, but increasingly all over the country, uh, there's specialization. So you either grow grains or you grow animals, but probably not both. So what are the inputs and outputs? Well, the inputs, I mentioned feed grains, and um, it used to be that feed grains accounted for about 60% of total corn production, for example, was destined for animal feed. Now the majority goes to uh, biofuel production, ethanol. But once the ethanol is produced, we then take that uh, dried distiller's grains, the byproduct, and feed them back to the livestock. So you could say that even if, even if the majority of feed grown is initially good at ethanol production, they're still ending up in this animal feed. Um, fossil fuels. Uh, in recent years, we probably don't use quite as many nitrate fertilizers as used to be used, uh, but pesticide use keeps going up. And in any case, fossil fuel intense, intensivity, the intensive use of fossil fuels is still a major factor of modern industrial American food production. And then antibiotics. I used to have antibiotics and arsenic here as major inputs. Uh, just two months ago, after some pressure from us and from the Center for Food Safety, uh, the three major producers of arsenic feed additives uh, told the FDA that they were going to take them off the market. So that's a major change. and it. It goes to show you that, that some changes can happen. What are the outputs? Uh, I'm going to talk later about manure and nitrates, but I want to talk first about some of the antibiotics-related outputs, namely residues and resistant bacteria. So one of the fundamental shifts uh, when you think about antibiotic resistance in farming is to stop thinking of us as the center of the world and rather think of the world as a bacterial world where we just happen to be living in it. But really, if you think about it, we're surrounded by bacteria. They vastly, vastly outnumber us. In fact, each and every one of us have two kilograms of bacteria just in our own bodies. That's almost five pounds worth. Uh, not to mention the bacteria in our sewage treatments plants, uh, uh, in our manure, in our kitchens, et cetera. And a lot of these are beneficial bacteria. So really, and, and because of our use of antibiotics, we've created a bacterial world that's affected by exposure to antibiotics as well, in our soaps, in our animal feed, and again, in our sewage treatment plants. So. This is a really important graphic from that CDC report, and this represents a major change in how epidemiologists, physicians, public health people are now thinking about this 
crisis of antibiotic resistance that's so critical. It used to be that the focus was on hospitals over on the right, uh, community members, and maybe, maybe there was a little mention about everything on the left-hand side of your screen. Now they're showing appropriately that this microbial ecosystem is really complex and there's at least as much going on on the animal side as on the human side. So um, let me just uh, simplify this a little bit. Like, uh, here in the most basic way using antibiotics creates resistance then the creation and spread of resistance isn't just something that happens on farms or hospitals or clinics it happens everywhere everywhere where bacteria live and uh, where bact uh, antibiotics spread which is basically everywhere that we live and, and inhabit so this is the simplified version where on the left-hand side you've got antibiotics really prevalent in the animal production environment. They're obviously carrying bacteria, we're carrying bacteria, and the way that those bacteria become resistant and then spread to humans is three major routes. On the bottom there can be environmental spread, so you give an animal antibiotics, about three-quarters of those antibiotics go through their gut and land in the manure. So everywhere that we think about manure going, whether it's spread on the fields, into the waterways, into the sewage treatment plant, there's going to be antibiotics as well as antibiotic-resistant bacteria. In the middle box, we see studies showing that workers in farms, whether they're farmers themselves or CAFO workers, can be conduits for spreading resistance from the farm back to their families, back to their communities. And then the most common one, and the one that people most appreciate, is the way that food can carry resistant bacteria from the farm to the people that eat the food and then into their guts and then into the broader population. So let me elaborate a little bit. Here's a really interesting study that my friend Jim Johnson, he's at the VA Medical Center in Minneapolis, did about six years ago. Uh, and what he did was pretty interesting. He went out and he looked at E. coli bacteria, and these are bacteria that cause urinary tract infections, among other things, but they're also commonly found on meat. And he compared two kinds of E. coli, the kind that are susceptible to antibiotics, and the kind that are resistant to antibiotics, and he compared the, bacteria, the E. coli that were found from two sources, ones that were found in humans and ones that were found on poultry. And when he mapped it out, he found that the poultry E. coli, whether resistant or susceptible, uh, looked very similar to one another, and they're in the red. The human E. coli are in blue, and you notice that there is one blue line by itself, and those are the E. coli on people that are, res uh, that are susceptible to antibiotics, so they're the easy-to-treat E. coli. And then there's the drug-resistant E. coli. And what he noted was that the drug-resistant E. coli in people look just like the E. coli from poultry. And so he said this is really good evidence that uh, at least in this case, with these 243 E. coli, the resistant E. coli seem to be coming from the chicken and then getting into the human population. And in fact, what we've seen now is several years' worth of studies uh, suggesting exactly the same thing, that resistant, drug-resistant E. coli are coming, uh, at least in many cases, from chicken and turkey and then getting uh, and then people eat those meat products and they get drug-resistant E. coli infections. And in fact, E. coli is not the only uh, resistant bacteria in our meat supply. Um, these numbers, which were compiled by the Environmental Working Group, are actually data from a federal database called NARMS, 
the National Antimicrobial Resistant Monitoring System. And they show that whether we're talking about ground turkey or ground beef or chicken thighs or pork chops uh, and even um, ground chicken, uh, a substantial percentage are going to carry uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria on them. Now it is true that if you do a really good job of cooking, uh, you'll probably kill those bacteria. But um, there's still a threat to people in the kitchen because we often pick up food poisoning in the kitchen. And a lot of people don't do a terribly good job of cooking. And so we have millions upon millions of uh, food poisoning infections a year. So um, upstream, at least some of these are coming from the farm. Now this is not I, uh, the main issue, I think, with antibiotics being used so commonly in these livestock operations is these resistant bugs that end up on the meat. Not the antibiotic residues themselves, but the antibiotic bac resistant bacteria. However, the USDA still does t uh, test meat in the U.S. food supply for antibiotic residues as well as residues of other things like heavy metals and pesticides. And it's concerning that we still find residues of these drugs and other chemicals in the meat supply. And I, I picked out some from the upper Midwest. They're, they're from all over the country, but there's some pretty significant uh, violations occurring in Ohio, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, and Ohio again. So it's just something to be aware of, that it's really a two-part problem, antibiotic-resistant bacteria on the meat, and then drug residues in the food as well. And then finally, uh, and I'm moving to wrap up here, I want to point to two really interesting studies in the last couple of years. And these are studies that, again, think of the ecosystem, the microbial ecosystem as a whole. And what they did is they looked at bacteria not on meat, not on farms, but in groundwater and in soil. And these two studies found that in the first case, bacteria from the groundwater uh, that were exposed to trace amounts of, a, of an antibiotic called uh, sulfamethoxazole, it's a sulfa antibiotic, uh, were in fact affected in their ability to denitrify, uh, uh, to uh, break down nitrogen. And this is important because we know that excess nitrogen in water, in groundwater, can not only uh, have harmful effects in the water bodies, but on people as well. So for example, uh, babies who are exposed to too many nitrates can get meth uh, 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 blue baby syndrome, methylglobinemia. In study two, uh, similarly, what they found was that concentrations of antibiotics in groundwater that were two to three orders of magnitude lower than a clinical level, nevertheless, can spur uh, the bacteria in the groundwater to develop resistance. So both of these really support the idea that uh, a farm reservoir of low levels of antibiotics, including sulfa drugs, can affect soil bacteria and groundwater bacteria in ways that are harmful. And here's just a diagram of the uh, nitrate cycle in soil which is critical to soil fertility. And it makes the point that when you interrupt that denitrification by soil bacteria, uh, you can throw everything else in this ecosystem off balance. And um, the country is not uniform in its nitrate ion concentration uh, uh, so in other words, the background levels are higher in many parts of the upper Midwest, including Wisconsin and parts of Minnesota. And so this added uh, effect in soils and groundwater um, uh, from antibiotics could be additive on top of these background levels. 
So just to make the point, getting back to manure and nitrates, that uh, Food and Water Watch estimates that Wisconsin's dairy cattle, hogs, beef cattle, and broiler chickens contribute an amount of raw manure that's as much as 69 million people. So roughly uh, 12 times uh, manure, uh, a manure impact that's 12 times higher than what one would expect from the population alone. And there's a lot of potential there, not only for pathogens in manure, for impaired waters, but also toxic algae. So water quality can impact downstream, uh, like the dead zone at the uh, mouth of the Mississippi. It can impact the Great Lakes, uh, which is, you know, if we think of Sturgeon Bay up there at the, at the base of the finger sticking out into Lake Michigan. This happens to be a picture of an algae growth in Lake Erie, uh, which is directly tied to nitrate contamination. And this is just to say that nitrates uh, uh, and other algae growth on beaches, for example, Great Lakes beaches, can have many human health effects as well. And so I want to just finish up talking a little bit about water pollution, and then I'm going to let uh, Tara Hines and, uh, comment if she wants. But um, right now, uh, there isn't a terribly coordinated or comprehensive uh, approach to water pollution from industrial uh, food animal production facilities, uh, some of which qualify as CAFOs. Only 41% of those are permitted under uh, NPDES uh, regulations. And there was a proposal a year ago by EPA that would have required information to be collected from all of those CAFOs, but uh, two years ago, sorry. But a year ago, that was dropped. That proposal was dropped under industry pressure. And maybe we'll hear more. And th this would be the possible route by which water pollution from these facilities would best be regulated at the federal level. So let me wrap up there. And I really look forward to questions and, and uh, from hearing more from those of you in the audience. Now let me just make note again of the details of this uh, 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 event in two days. And then show you again the biography from Tara Heinzen. And Tara, I think you're on the line. Do you have anything you want to add? Or um, that's totally up to you. Sure, thanks. I'll just add to that last slide about EPA's rule to collect basic information from all CAFOs. Just a little follow-up to that. As David said, EPA proposed a rule that more than 40 years after the passage of the Federal Clean Water Act would finally have given the agency extremely basic information about these industrial facilities, such as how much waste they produce, where they're located, and how many animals they can find. All very, very basic information that EPA acknowledged in its rule was absolutely critical to EPA being able to carry out its obligations under the Clean Water Act, just to do its job of figuring out who is discharging illegally and who needs one of these Clean Water Act permits that can help prevent the nutrients, the bacteria, the antibiotics, and everything else in that waste stream from reaching waterways and threatening public health and the environment. And following EPA's withdrawal of that rule, several organizations, including Environmental Integrity Project, Food and Water Watch, the Center for Food Safety, and the Humane Society of the United States, sued EPA in federal court. And our challenge basically says that EPA set out a very compelling reason for why it needs to follow through with this rule and collect this information. And for EPA to simply abandon that rule is unreasonable, it's what's called arbitrary and capricious, and that EPA violated the rules that it's required to follow as an agency, the federal agency, in making its decisions. So if EPA is going to abandon this important rule, it has to provide a reasonable basis for doing so, and we don't believe that they've done that. So right now that case is pending in federal district court, and we have no idea how that will go, but hopefully at some point a court will take 
that rule and tell EPA that it has to go back to the drawing board. Great. Thank you, Tara. Um, so I, I don't know that we've gotten any uh, questions yet, but uh, Rachel, do you want to open up the microphone so people can ask questions? Yeah, and absolutely. If, if while we're waiting for that, if Tiffany or Tara have any questions for me or of each other, that would be fine too. Okay, I'm going, this is Rachel, I'm going to unmute all of the attendees, and we'll see how that goes. If we get a lot of feedback or echoing, we might have to mute people. But if, if anyone has a specific question, uh, feel free to chime in. Okay, we might be getting a little bit too much feedback. So, David, uh, uh, I'm wondering if, if there's Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So, so folks, if you have questions, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, put them into the chat feature. Let me just kick things off by asking Tara. Tara, have you been, um, do you have anything to say about Wisconsin in particular in terms of kind of, uh, some of these water pollution questions, what, what you know about the state of the uh, legal background oh, David. for Wisconsin? Sure. Hey, David, maybe yes. before we go there, we do have a question from Eric Sterling. So, Eric, I'm going to unmute you, and I'll let you ask your question, okay? Eric, are you there? It looks like you may have muted yourself. You might have to unmute. Why don't you just go ahead and relay the question? I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so Eric asked, looking at this more from the bottom up, uh, the collusion and impropriety between county board politics and swine CAFO expansion in rural Illinois seems apparent. Are there others finding it the same way from their county by county perspective? Most often, county health departments are under county board officials hierarchy and do not protect the public's interest. Eric Sterling, ICCAW. I, I, I don't know if the others want to comment, but I would just say, Eric, uh, that's a good question. I know that um, I have a collaborator, uh, Dave Osterberg, at the University of Iowa School of Public Health. Uh, and a few years ago, we looked at county and uh, attempts to regulate CAFOs. And at least from a scan of the experience in Iowa, found that um, this isn't exactly what you were talking about, but even when counties did attempt to influence siting decisions for new CAFOs, they were often thwarted either by uh, preemption cases or in the case of Iowa, I believe it was a constitutional issue. The, uh, the, the Supreme Court in Iowa, if I'm not mistaken, made a decision that the freedom to farm provision of the Constitution prohibited counties like Worth County, Iowa from trying to say on public health grounds that a certain facility of a certain size should not be cited. So, Tara, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, I can just say in Wisconsin, I'm not extremely familiar with the citing regulations, but I do know that in, I think, 2004 or 2006, the state passed a law, the Livestock Facilities Siting Law, I believe, that dramatically reduced local control over CAFO siting and established a very unattainable 
burden for municipalities and localities to meet to justify any sort of restriction on siting based on public health or any other factor um, that they wanted to impose on a livestock facility. And there's one case in which a township, the town of Magnolia, attempted to require additional, I believe, groundwater monitoring for a proposed or expanding dairy. And they did a lot of work to try to meet that heightened burden to demonstrate the need for this um, additional health-based monitoring. And ultimately, they lost in the state Supreme Court. So I know it's gotten a lot harder in Wisconsin. So I've got so a I've, I've got a comment yeah. here from Bruce, from Bruce Dimmick. He said here in central Wisconsin they're seeing same, some of the same things with respect to dairy capos. Bruce, I'm going to unmute you if you want to um, if you have anything you want to say about that. Um, I don't know if this is coming through, but yes, we are. Although we in a town of Saratoga, Wisconsin, are uh, have quite an active uh, group uh, uh, fighting a CAFO uh, sponsored by the Basaki family uh, that essentially would decimate our town. And so far, I would say uh, we fought them to a standoff, uh, but they are, they've got uh, more expensive lawyers than we can afford. So we're not sure where we'll end up, but we're not about to give up. Bruce, do, do you uh, have any experience on whether the health professionals, most rural communities have at least a clinic or a health professional if they're of moderate size, are they aware of these antibiotics related issues at all, do you think? Uh, they may well be, but uh, our, as, as mentioned by the previous uh, speaker, <coughs> The county board um, is uh, largely in the CAFO camp, not 100 percent, but largely. Uh, therefore, those people that, whose jobs are vulnerable to uh, government oversight uh, don't speak up very much. Yeah. I have kind of an interesting thing that I've been hearing, uh, and and, uh, and it's a little more upbeat, uh, uh, I guess, um, and it's technology, where technology is going. And, it, you know, one of the challenges with pollution is that it's hard to attribute it. So legally, uh, you know, unless you can draw a cause and effect, it can be harder to uh, have a good result from a legal action, but but one thing that's uh, for those of you who have been following this outbreak of salmonella associated with Foster Farms chicken in California, um, Foster Farms is is a big regional chicken producer, and it turned out that um, we can trace uh, uh, quite a few people getting sick from a particular strain of salmonella that we know contaminated Foster Farms chicken. And what's happened is that the microbiologists have gotten so smart and the technology that they use to identify particular bugs has gotten so refined that basically we can, we're getting close to the point within the next few years of being able to match a particular bug causing an illness in a person with potentially the farm where that bug came from. And to my mind, that might be a bit of a game changer. Yeah. These, are, uh, uh, these are antibiotic resistant strains, so uh, they, they very much tend to be from operations that are using uh, a lot of antibiotics or, or the antibiotics to which the bug is resistant. So. I think that's interesting. David, we have another question um, from Forrest Janke, who isn't connected by audio, so I'll just read his question. Do you know of any successful attempts to prevent CAFOs from opening besides the rights-based ordinances in various communities through the work of CELDF? Can 
Sarah? I think I missed a bit of what you said. You said stop sure. CFOs uh, from citing, and then I think you cut out for just a second. Okay. It was, do you know of any successful attempts to prevent CAFOs from opening besides the rights-based ordinances passed in various communities through the work of CELDF, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund? Okay. I know that there, not too long ago, was a big success in northern Illinois. It was the HOMES is the organization. It's a community-based community group. I think it stands for Helping Others Maintain Environmental Standards. And they initiated a grassroots organizing and legal campaign against a proposed mega dairy called Traditions Dairy. And it was being proposed by an out-of-state company that wanted to construct a very large facility on vulnerable karst um, topography, which they thought would threaten their groundwater as well as their surface water. So the community organized. They raised money for a local attorney. And they also worked very hard to generate interest from the Federal Environmental Protection Agency and petitioned EPA to do some information collection and environmental testing around the facility to evaluate the risks that it posed to their water supplies. And ultimately, their legal persistence and their organizing persistence drove the company to actually abandon the facility, abandon the project, um, tear down what they had already started building. And unfortunately, I think they ended up relocating and finding a new site to build their facility elsewhere. But it was a successful strategy for this community. Um, I know there's an organization that is a very good model for this type of community action in Iowa called Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. And they use grassroots organizing to oppose proposed hog confinements primarily all over the state of Iowa, wherever people contact them and ask them for help. And they've stopped dozens of facilities from constructing over the past several decades just through really smart, strategic grassroots work and very smart you know, media work that um, helps educate local decision makers, whether it's county board supervisors and other local decision makers about the impacts of that proposed facility. And just that community pressure has been successful in many cases. Great. I think this is another question possibly for Tiffany. But uh, the question was, are you testing any creeks or rivers in close proximity to CAFOs for antibiotics in Wisconsin? Well, um, uh, let me jump in. Uh, and Tiffany, feel free to jump in if you have more to add. But um, you know, your tax dollars have over the years supported some testing by the U.S. Geological Survey. And um, periodically, when Congress looks for things to cut in terms of environmental programs, uh, the program at the U.S. Geological Survey is always one of the ones that they want to get rid of. And it is the program that tests waterways across the country for things like antibiotic residues and antibiotic resistant bacteria. So, um, you know, in the past, groups like Terra's and mine have fought hard at the DC level for programs like that, especially that the USGS is a, it's a pretty scientific agency. It doesn't do any like most federal agencies, it doesn't wade into the advocacy battles at all. It just pretty much is just the facts, ma'am. And so they do waterway testing. And you know, really, if if we're not doing that kind of basic testing, then uh, uh, it really is just a matter of wanting to bury some of these issues out of sight. I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense for states or organizations like ours long term to be doing that testing because that's it can be expensive and the technical expertise in the laboratories are are best centralized rather than replicated in a lot of different localities. Uh, that was that was Forrest's 
question. No, that was Eric's question, but Forrest has a response. I'm going to unmute you, Forrest, if you want to ask your question or your comment. Are you there, Forrest? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, we, Crawford Stewardship Project, that is, have been monitoring streams running uh, downhill from a big hog CAFO in our county, and uh, we have been finding or have found antibiotic-resistant bacteria in the streams as well as nutrient levels above uh, the legal limits and E. coli and all sorts of lovely things. And we've told the DNR about this repeatedly and have had no action at all yet. Well, no, I won't say no action. They've gotten one notice of noncompliance. Right. And the, the NPDES permitting doesn't currently have a, uh, any kind of criteria for antibiotic resistant organisms, isn't that right, Tara? It really doesn't have criteria for much of anything. So that's the Clean Water Act permit system that EPA has set out. And Wisconsin does require those permits for large CAFOs, but they don't require any numeric limits on pollution discharged, and they do not require any pollution monitoring of streams that may be impacted by discharges. I, w I would point out that there are countries like Denmark I mentioned where they have CAFO style production, but they've greatly changed the way the production model happens uh, in ways that probably reduce greatly uh, the impacts on animal welfare and animal health as well as human health. So for example, you know, they through doing some fairly simple things, they were able to reduce their antimicrobial use by 60% pretty rapidly. So, you know, I think it's great to have grassroots level strategies addressing facility by facility but it's also strategically worth thinking about um, other, you know, other possibilities, uh, you know, at the state level or more than state level to address some of these upstream factors like antibiotic use. You know, if there were a way to put restrictions on antibiotic use, it would be much harder to operate a CAFO in the most destructive and unhealthy ways. It looks like there are no other questions at this time. Does anybody else have a specific question they'd like to ask before we wrap up? Go ahead. Uh, did you, uh, is anybody on the line planning on going to the Sturgeon Bay Conference? Okay. Looks like it looks like Bruce Dimmick is Karen Wollenberg. There's a few on here. Yep. Great. So I'd I'd be curious. You know, feel free to contact me if you have any feedback. I work very closely with uh, at least one of the speakers, Steve Roach, and you know, people like Tara and I and Steve all communicate quite a bit around what's going on at both the regional level and the national level. So, you know, if any of you have specific questions or needs, you know, don't hesitate to reach out and contact us. I hope I can talk for you, Tara. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I do some work with Wisconsin organizations, and so, um, yes, please contact me if you have any questions that come out of this or, you know, the forum this Saturday which I also encourage you to go to. And I work sometimes with Keeve Knackman from Johns Hopkins, and he's also fantastic. Great. Well, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Great. Yep, I think that's it. We don't have any other questions lined up unless there's any last minute questions. Doesn't look like it. So I'll let you close, David.
Uh, well, it, it, just to say thank you again. If, if uh, as I said, if you would like to uh, contact us for any reason, these are our emails and other addresses. And otherwise, we wish you a good night. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks, everyone.